Hi all, we're going to look now at an over the board game I played on the Monday just gone against Sid Kalinski of Ilford Chess Club. So Barnet Chess Club was playing Ilford in the North Circular League. He was white, he played e4 and I played the Sicilian defence with c5 and he played now c3. I don't really know much theory uh, uh, with the d5 lines in the c3 Sicilian. I didn't quite fancy knight f6, so actually I wanted to transpose it into a French defence. I played e6, because I don't mind so much the advanced variation of the French defence. So he played d4 and I played d5. So I'm encouraging to play the advance. I'm not too bothered if he plays e takes d5, because I would play e takes d5 and play it as a kind of tarash. Anyway, he played e5. And now here, I believe there's two main plans. Either knight c6 or this queen b6 idea with the idea of trading this bad bishop very, very rapidly for this bishop. So, positionally, I, I favoured queen b6 as a variation choice. So, after knight f3, bishop d7. There was a famous um, Fisher versus Petrosian game where I believe Fisher played a4 here to stop this trade of light squared bishops. Anyway, my opponent, he didn't mind this trade, because he's got in mind this very dangerous pawn sack line, which I've done a bit of research in the Let's Play Chess.com Master Collection, and I really can't see any clear lines yet for black. If there are any, I, I might do another video on them. So this pawn sacrifice starts with c4 here, and after the exchange, now d5. So it's quite difficult to see what black should do here. In the master collection, there are some game examples with knight e7. Put that as a new variation. But then, actually, not knight c3, but actually queen a4 check is uh, an interesting move here. Because this knight can't go to c6 now. And after say knight there, then either d6 or d takes e. And I don't really know the theory of this. But anyway, so in the game, I had this vague idea that this variation would be okay, just taking on d5, gaining a tempo on black on the white queen, and now playing a quick queen b4 check, checking it out of, of um, having to uh, play with white's queen on the board. I thought at least I wouldn't be hacked that easily. So I thought actually he played knight d2, but actually he took here on b4, which is probably a mistake. It lets me off the hook a bit with an easy game. So I don't mind so much these double pawns, because maybe this pawn's going to be slightly weak and I can sort of carry on developing and castle queenside even. So he castled here, and after knight bc6, actually he played knight bd2. After the game in the post-mortem, he was thinking bishop f4 might have been better to drop the bishop back to g3 if knight g6. I think he might be right. This gave me a kind of comfortable game with this pressure on the e-pawn. But what was very interesting now, this e-pawn became a central thing about the whole game. Could it ever be taken by black or not? So throughout the entire game it was always an issue for who would get the advantage. Especially because he now played e6 and I didn't take it, I played f6. I had this idea of using the e5 square and somehow surrounding the pawn later. But it was much more difficult to achieve than I hoped for. One aspect to consider here is that I've weakened a little bit the f5 square control. If he ever gets a knight to f5, this is going to be quite dangerous. And we'll see later that actually occurred. After knight e4, this knight's already got a potential manoeuvre now, knight g3 to f5, to consider now. But there's also another thing to concern black, is white's control of this c5 square, which is on the semi-open c file. So I have to be quite concerned about this positional pressure that can be built up. I castled, and he did actually play bishop e3 now, with dangerous threats of, say, rook a c1, or bishop c5. I played immediately now b6 to parry rook c1 with king b7, and he played rook a d1, so he realised that maybe king b7 I'd be okay, just about. I looked at rook takes c6, and it seemed to be quite harmless. So anyway, after rook a d1, I played king b7, and now knight g3. So we see one problem with this f6 idea. This f5 square is a real pain. And actually, to be honest, I've had two bad results, with which all 
previously in the season because of the f5 square, the opponent's knights coming to f5. It seems to be a recurring problem in my games. Or maybe it's just generally one of the powerful themes in chess, getting a knight to f5. Especially when black's king is near such a knight. But anyway, rook takes d1, rook takes d1. I was, I was pleased with this because I thought I'd at least put some pressure on this e6 pawn after he exchanged, which he volunteered to. And he protects that. So try and, I try and undermine the protector, and he protects the protector. So I take the protector, he takes back. So he's still, that pesky pawn is still being protected now. So I blockade it, and after f4 he's threatening even to give it support now with his f pawn. So I play a6, because I want to try and use my king, but I don't want him to come in with his knight to b5. Then after g4 I play knight d6, king f2 g6 to try and stop this connection um, this pawn being protected king f3 knight takes d4 and after bishop takes d4 I play f5 and now he I, my idea of f5 I've got to stop this king infiltration but the thing is the king can come the other way which was a threat in the game um, after g takes f5 I take with a pawn, because I calculate that after bishop f6, I've got knight d5 here just about stopping this pawn. So he can't play e7 because the knight takes f6. So he plays actually here bishop e5, and off for the draw. Now the match situation, it's a six board match, and we've won two games, and we've drawn two. Which means we've got one game in progress, apart from this game. So by agreeing a draw here, the ma our team would win against Ilford. After a long consideration, I actually felt it's not that easy to get an advantage here. I've, e I've looked at it with Ribka and it's, it's still not that easy. White can end up you know, with a very good position still. Um, here's a critical idea. King c6, king g3, now knight e7, king h4. So we see the king infiltrating now. King d5, so I'm finally rounding up this pesky pawn. But it can let it go. Just king g5, king takes e6, king h6. So this this h pawn could be dangerous. Let's say knight g6, bishop c7, king d5, king takes h7. So this isn't so easy for black. I've got this as a continuing variation now. So maybe I would have been better in this um, king and pawn ending. But there's no way I would have, I've calculated any of this. Um, I was just trying to calculate just a few moves ahead to see what would happen in, in this kind of um, position. So anyway, the final position was after bishop e5, and I did accept the draw so we could win the match in the North Circular League um, First Division. Let's have a quick overview and summary of this game. So I started out as a Sicilian defence and didn't mind going into the French defence advanced variation. So I played this plan of exchanging off the bad bishop. He played this dangerous pawn sacrifice plan, which I still really don't know a good line against. If you know any really good lines against this, please leave them as comments on YouTube. That would really help improve my play and other people reading um, for this game. So I just took on d5. I'm not sure this is a great line, but I did find actually a Drev game which followed a similar path. Um, Drev was black. So we have this position where this e pawn is very interesting not just from the point of view of protecting it but these other squares like f5 become dangerous for black so it's not so easy for black to play this at all despite the simplification and not so easy to round the pawn up so this end game was a bit tricky and I decided not to play on just just to secure a match victory anyway so I hope you found some of that instructive and enjoyable so leave any comments on YouTube and see you later. Thanks very much.